May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, one verse, verse 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone that saith, unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who is our teacher, and our Lord, and our Savior. Dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating and preserving triune God. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry also owned slaves. It's called hypocrisy. Saying one thing, doing something else. For years, those of uh, the older ones here may remember this. For years, schools taught their young students not to lie, and they use the example of George Washington about the story where George Washington cut down the cherry tree of his father. Well, that was a lie. George Washington never cut down the cherry tree of his father, but here they're trying to teach people not to lie by telling a story that itself is a lie. That's hypocrisy. So a uh, sociologist at the Hoover, or the, I mean the Hudson Institute, a, uh, a man, a, a PhD in sociology at the Hudson Institute, and he says he thinks that hypocrisy is essential. Hypocrisy is central to our society, he says. In fact, I'll quote to you what he says. He says, if you're not hypocritical by age 14, you haven't been socialized. The system works on hypocrisy. In other words, most people are perfectly prepared to live with it. Some people think, dead seriously, that you should not be hypocritical. But most of us think it is an almost essential social lubricant and protector. Well, no surprise then that this creeps into churches, this hypocrisy, into Christian churches, where people say things that they don't really mean. They do things like speak the Apostles' Creed, like we spoke a moment ago. I believe this, I believe that, and so forth, based on the Bible, and they speak those words but they either don't understand them or they don't mean them. They speak the Lord's Prayer with their lips, but they don't know what they're saying or they don't mean it when they say it. They speak the liturgy, they sing the liturgy, they sing the hymns, but they're just mouthing what the hymnal or the worship folder tells them to say, and they don't really believe it or mean it. And so we come to Jesus' words in our text. Jesus said of these hypocrites and these people that they saith unto me, Lord, Lord. But that's all it is. It's just words. They just say it. Outwardly, they belong to a church. They have an outward appearance of religiosity. But that is no ticket to heaven, Jesus says here. The Bible says those who do it only as a show, without understanding or following the Bible in their hearts, the Bible says, quote, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, which is reminiscent of our sermon about a month ago. They're just going through the motions, if you remember that sermon. 
the Bible, the Lord said, This people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. And so Jesus describes these people, they saith unto me, Lord, Lord. But it's just words. Now there's nothing wrong with saying those words. To call Jesus Lord is a great thing. He is Lord, he is King of all things, and especially the kingdom of God and the church. There's nothing wrong with calling him Lord, but there's something wrong with saying it, but not meaning it. The fact is that there are many people who sit in church on Sunday and mouth one thing. They say one thing, and then they go out of the church building, and all through the week, they do something else. In Sunday worship service, they come and they say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. But yet, they go out of these walls, and then they go home, and they go to their work or wherever in the world, and they show no interest in God the Father Almighty. They show no interest in learning about him through his inspired, revealed word, the Bible, during the week. So do they really believe in God the Father Almighty? Or were those just words they said? In Sunday worship, they say they are living for Jesus Christ. And yet through the week, they're living for everything but Jesus Christ. On Sunday, they may sing the hymn, Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. But they're not giving with a cheerful heart whatever they give to the Lord Jesus in their life. On Sunday morning, they may sing that great hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. But through the week, they're not even using the one tongue they have to speak their great Redeemer's praise to other people. On Sunday, they pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then they go out and they forgive no one, but hold grudges and gossip about the wrongs of other people. The Bible says, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. It's not hard to say the words of Christianity. But to say those words is not enough. Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The emphasis in this verse is on two words, saith and doeth. Words are cheap. Actions speak much louder than words. At one point, Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Just going through the formality of church, the formality of being a Christian, isn't enough. Jesus sees through that if it's only a formality. He knows that many go through the formality of saying and calling him Lord, Lord, but are not true believers in Jesus. For example, you had Judas, one of the 12 apostles. One of the 12 apostles of Jesus, Judas. He comes to Jesus. He calls him Master. He even kisses him. But it was all to betray Jesus.
hypocrisy. Judas said the words, but his actions spoke louder than his words. The kingdom of heaven does not go by leaves, but by fruits. I read once about a Christian missionary out west in the early days of our country, the frontier, where there's lots of Indians. I guess we call them Native Americans now, whatever. But anyway, this, this missionary was sent to uh, evangelize and bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the uh, Indians. And he knew that to, uh, to really get to, to speak to the Indians, he had to talk to the chief of the tribe. So he went to the chief of the tribe, of this one tribe, and he tried to speak to him the words of the Bible, the word of God, the word of salvation in Christ Jesus, to get him and his tribe to convert to Christianity, Christian faith. He was talking to this chief, but the chief stopped him and said, hold on. I be no Christian. Christians lie. Christians cheat. Christians steal. Christians get drunk. Christians murder. They've stolen my lands. They've slain my tribe. I be no Christian. He saw the hypocrisy in people who called themselves Christians but weren't. Hypocrisy. Saying one thing, but not believing it, and doing the other. The Bible says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. They're like, they're like sows. You know, you know, you know what sows are? Uh, Female pigs? What do they love to do? Where, where are they in their element? What do sows love? They love their sty, where there's mud. And they can go and wallow in the mud from head to foot. And that's what they like to do, and that's their element. Now, you can take that sow out of the mud and out of the sty. And you can wash it off. And you can put a nice silk dress on it and a fancy hat. And you can bring it into your living room. And you can invite your friends in to have tea with the sow. And the sow will sit there in the chair and will look ever so demure. And maybe your friends will say, oh, what a nice sow. But you know that that sow doesn't want to be there. That sow's feeling very uncomfortable. And if you notice, it'll be looking at the door every now and then, glancing at the door, waiting for that door to open so it can do what? Run out that door, and you follow that sow in the fancy dress. And where does that sow immediately go? Back to the mud, back to the sty, to wallow head and foot. It's like a hypocrite. They have no intention of doing as Jesus says here, my Father's will. They don't like God's will. They want to do their will. They want to follow the ways of the ungodly and the world. That's what they really admire. And maybe that for some motive they might want to join a church and put on the silk dress of religiosity and go to church, but you know they don't want to be there. They're feeling uncomfortable. You can just see their eyes looking at their watch and looking at the door and saying, oh, I can't wait for that door to open. I can get out that door. And go back to the ways of sin. It's like the sow who returns to the muck, the mire. It's like the sow in the living room. His thoughts aren't on the tea and the silk dress. The hypocrite's thoughts are in the world. 
The Bible says the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's who shall enter heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father. What is the will of God? This is his commandment, the Bible says, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, unquote. This is the will of God. First, that we confess our sins sincerely. We really believe we have not kept the Ten Commandments and all the Word of God, the Law of God. We are heartily sorry. We really are. We have not obeyed our Creator. We repent of it. We want to turn from it. And then we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We hear that even though we have broken the Ten Commandments, even though we have no interest in learning about God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth during the week, we're hardly sorry about that. We desire to turn from that and we start learning about God the Father Almighty from his word. We stop living only for ourselves, start living for Jesus. We do what we sing about in church, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. We're sorry that we haven't done that and we repent. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We're sorry that we haven't used the one tongue God gave us to speak our great Redeemer's praise when we have the opportunity. And we confess and we repent of these sins and we turn to Jesus, who is God the Son, who came down from heaven so that we might be saved from all these sins of ours. We don't think we're good people. We think we deserve hell. But that Jesus has saved us from hell because he took our hell upon himself for us. He was forsaken of God. Why hast thou forsaken me, Jesus cried from his cross as he suffered and died for our sins in our place. He paid, he atoned for all of our sins as our substitute. And then he rose from the dead after he died and shed his blood for our sins. He rose from the dead to prove he truly is our creator. He is the Lord of life. And he said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You know what that means? That means heaven. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Oh, what a great thing he has done for us. The greatest thing that will ever happen to us. He has given us heaven forever. Heaven is even greater than the Garden of Eden. You ever thought of that? Heaven is greater than the Garden of Eden. Jesus has given us something greater than Adam lost. Because in the Garden of Eden, you could sin. You could be tempted and sin and fall, but in heaven you can't. You can't be tempted in heaven. Satan can't go to heaven. Satan will not be in heaven. He can't tempt you in heaven. You can't sin in heaven. You'll never fall from heaven. It's even greater than the Garden of Eden. This is your gift, earned for you completely by Jesus Christ, God the Son, sent by God the Father, who he mentions in this text. Truly believe in him, not just hypocritically, but in your soul. Put all your trust in Jesus. Mean it when you say it. That's doing the will of God. This is the will of God, that we should believe 
on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, the Bible says. The Father's will is that you trust in Jesus rather than in yourself. And that you understand what that means. And you mean it when you say it. You're not just saying the words. But then the Bible goes even further and it says, If you have this faith in Jesus alone, as your Savior, your Lord, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. The true believers in Jesus Christ as their God and Savior, they become, Jesus said, new people. A new person. It's like being born again. You're renewed. You're transformed by the Holy Ghost in your heart. And he brings you the power for the first time to now carry out the commandments of God the Father. Couldn't do it before. You were dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. But now, if you have true faith in Christ, in the true triune God, and in his inspired word, the Bible, you now have the Holy Ghost of God living within you, empowering you now to also do pleasing works and obey his commandments. Here's a quiz question for you. What are the first four books of the New Testament? What do we call them? The Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the fifth book? Fifth book of the New Testament after John. It's called the Book of Acts. In fact, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. You notice it's not called the Faith of the Apostles. It's called the Acts of the apostles, because you could see their faith through their acts. That they lived their faith, it wasn't just words. If you don't believe the Bible, if you don't believe in the triune God, if you don't intend to strive to obey the true God and his word and live the true Christian faith, then don't stand up and say you do believe it. Be consistent. But once having made the true Christian profession of faith, cost what it may, live up to it. May the Holy Ghost empower us all so to do. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.